Guys, I've got exciting news for you. I'm going to conduct a puzzle rush contest for my subscribers. I'm going to give away three one month Diamond Club memberships of chess.com for my subscribers. You've got seven days to participate in this contest. You must obtain your best puzzle rush score during these seven days. Comment your highest score in puzzle rush below this video. The first three winners are going to get one month Diamond Club membership for free. You've got to subscribe to the channel to participate in this contest. You also need to send the screenshot of your highest puzzle rush score and the chess.com username to my email address. I've given the email address in the description. Diamond Club membership with chess.com gives you unlimited access to all the cool features of chess.com. Unlimited tactics, unlimited puzzle rush, unlimited lessons and unlimited videos. Subscribe to the channel and participate in this contest. Read the description below for more details of the contest. Hi guys, I'm back with another video on chess and game technique. We took a detailed look at rook and pawn versus rook and game in the last video. Please check out that video if you have not watched it already. We're going to make an effort to improve our endgame technique in a slow and steady fashion. King and pawn endgames are extremely important because they are very common. This video series will require many videos. Now let's take a crack at the basic ideas and positions in king and pawn endgames. You can set the video to a higher speed if you are familiar with these basic ideas. Take a look at this position. White has got an extra pawn but the white king is far away from the pawn. Will the game end in a draw? Can white win this game? It all comes down to whose turn it is to move. If it's white's turn to move, white can win the game easily. White has to play the move f6. White cannot move the king because the king cannot support the pawn. So, Black can try the move king c5, f7, king d6, and f8 queens. White can win the game easily. Now if it's black's turn to move, king c5 draws the game. So king c5, f6, king d6, f7, king e7, f8 queens and king cross f8. Black draws the game. There is a simple rule that you can use when you encounter such positions. This rule is called the rule of the square. If the defending king is in the square of the pawn or if he can step into it then he can capture the pawn. This rule is valid only if the king of the superior side cannot support the pawn. For example here the square of the pawn consists of the squares f5, f8, c8 and c5. Black king can secure the draw when he is able to step into the square. White wins the game without the support of the king when the black king is not able to enter the square of the pawn. Here black can draw the game if it is his turn to move or else white wins the game. Now take a look at another position. It's white to move here. Can black secure a draw here? If we apply the rule of the square here, black should be able to secure a draw, right? No, as a matter of fact, black cannot secure a draw here if it's white's turn to move. White can go ahead and play the move a4. White pawn can go two squares at a time. Now this is the square of the a4 pawn. Now black king has to reach e4 in time to catch the pawn. But black cannot step into the e4 square once a4 is played because the black king is short of one move. Let us play it out king f4, a5, king e5, a6, king d6, a7, 
king c7 and a8 queens. So this position is kind of like an exception. The fact that the pawn can move two squares from the beginning makes the rule of the square invalid here. Do take a note of this. Ideas like this are extremely simple but if you remember these ideas it can make your life easy as a chess player. These ideas and positions are covered extensively in the book Secrets of Pawn Endings. You can check it out. The link is available in the description. We looked at positions where the king of the superior side was far away. Now if the pawn has the support of the king, it can often be escorted to the 8th rank. The king needs to reach the key square in order to win the game. It does not matter whose turn it is to move. If the king reaches the key square in time, the superior side wins the game. Take a look at this position. The pawn is on the f6 square and the king is on the e7 square. The position of the black king does not matter here. That is why I have removed it from the board. e7, f7, g7, e8, f8 and g8 are the key squares here. The position of black king does not matter here and white can win the game easily. Now for example let us take a look at this position. If it's white's turn to move here then white cannot win the game. White cannot get hold of the key squares. Now if white plays a move like f7 check then black king will go king f8. Now white is forced to go king f6. Black king has nowhere to go and the game will end in a stalemate. The concept of key squares is extremely important in king and pawn endings. It is important that we understand the concept clearly. The two opposing kings could be anywhere on the board and calculating the endgame can prove to be extremely difficult. Once you understand the concept of key squares, you just need to calculate and see whether the king of the superior side is able to reach key squares in time. Pawns may not require the support of the king to win a game and key squares are not important in such end games. Now for example, let us take a look at the f3 pawn. e5, f5 and g5 are the key squares of the f3 pawn. If the king is able to reach any of these squares, the game can be easily won. If there are multiple pawns on the board, we will need to look at the specific position more closely and find the key squares. We will look at that in a later video. Now again, if the pawn is on f4, then e6, f6 and g6 are the key squares. When the pawn crosses the fourth rank of the board, there are more key squares that are available. For example, if the pawn is on f5, then e6, f6, g6, e7, f7 and g7 are the key squares. If the pawn is on f6, then e7, f7, g7, e8, f8 and g8 are the key squares. When the king of the superior side is on the key square, then the right to move does not matter. For example, take a look at this position. The pawn is on f5 and the white king has already occupied the key square e6. Now if it's black's turn to move, black would probably try the move king f8. Now king f6, king g8 king e7 and the f5 pawn will queen easily. Take a look at this position. White king is on the key square e6. Now if it's white's turn to move, then white can start with the move f6. Now king f8, f7, king g7, king e7, king h6, and f8 queens. White wins the game easily. So we looked at a position where the white king is already on the key square. Now what happens if the white king is not on the key square 
but is on the way to a key square, how would you analyze that position? Take a look at this position with the pawn on f4. e6, f6 and g6 are the key squares here. But the white king is on e5. Does the right to move matter here? As a matter of fact, it does. If it's black to move here, then white wins the game. White has the opposition in that case and the black king is in Sukzwang. There are no drawing moves that are available for black. If it's black to move here, black would probably try the move king f7. Now king f5, king e7 back and now the white king can go king g6. White king has stepped onto the key square g6 and the game can be easily won. On the other hand, if it's white's turn to move, then black has got the opposition and black can hold the draw. For example, if king f5 is played, then king f7, king e5 back and king e7 back. Black can repeat the position and the game will end in a draw. Now if white decides to play f5 instead of king f5, then the key squares also move upward. White king has to step onto e6, f6, g6 or e7, f7 and g7. Black king would not allow that. Black king would go king f7. Now white has to play f6. Now the key squares have shifted upward again. King f8, king e6, king e8, f7 check, king f8 and white is forced to play king f6. The game ends in a stalemate. So the opposition is an important idea. The superior side must have the opposition in order to win the game. Now let us look at different kinds of opposition. The concept of opposition is extremely important because it helps you analyze king and pawn endgames with ease. Now let us examine different kinds of opposition. I have removed the pawns in the position. This position that we are looking at, if it's black's turn to move, then white has the opposition. This opposition is called the near opposition since the kings are only one square apart. Now for example, if black plays king e7, then white goes king g6. White king has gained access to the key squares and can win the game easily. On the other hand, if black goes king g7, then white can go king e6. Now again, the win is easy because white has gained access to the key squares. Black can also try the move king f8. Now if king f8 is played, then white can go king f6. If black goes king e8, then king g7 and white can win the game easily. Now take a look at another position. There are three squares between the two kings. Now if it's black's turn to move here, then white is said to have distant opposition. It is important to note the fact that the number of squares between the two squares is an odd number. Whenever the number of the squares between the two kings is an odd number, the superior side is said to have the opposition because it's the defending side's turn to move and the distant opposition can be easily converted into a near opposition. For example, if the black king goes king e7, the near opposition can be gained easily. White simply has to play the move king e5. Now if black plays king f8 instead of king e7, then white can maintain the distant opposition with the move king f4. Now if king e8 is played, white cannot make any progress if he plays the move king e4 again. White must go king g5. Now if king f7 is played, then white can gain the near opposition with the move king f5. Now let's look at diagonal opposition. The kings are facing each other diagonally and the number of squares between them is odd. If it's black's turn to move here, then white has the diagonal opposition. For example, if black were to play king f8, 
then king f6 gains the near opposition and white has gained access to the key squares. White can win the game easily. Take a look at this position. White king is on c2 and the black king is on f8. It's white's turn to move here. White can grab the opposition by playing the move king d2. Now there is something cool here. The white king and black king are placed at the corners of a rectangle. You should also note the fact that all the corner squares are of the same color. Now white is said to have gained the virtual opposition when he is able to step onto the corner of such a square. So white has played the move king d2 and gained the virtual opposition. Now let us see how virtual opposition translates to near opposition. Black goes king g8. Now white follows the rule again and goes king e2. Note the colors of the squares. They are all the same. Now king h8 and white goes king f2. Now if black plays a move like king h7, then white can follow the rule again and go king f3. Now if king h6 is played, then king f4 and white has gained the diagonal opposition. Now this diagonal opposition can be easily converted to near opposition. If you are not clear about the virtual opposition, please run through the moves again. We have learned some of the most important concepts in king and pawn endgames in this video. Now let us apply these concepts to specific position. The first one is going to be easy. We are going to look at a position from a game that was played between Gligoric and Bobby Fischer in 1959. It is black to move here. How can black secure the draw here? The number of squares between the two kings is an odd number. And black does not have the distant opposition. But black can hold the draw by preventing the white king from reaching the key squares. A6, B6 and C6 are the key squares in this position. Black has to play King B8. Now King C5 and King C7. Black has gained the opposition now. Now King B5, King B7, King A5 and King A7. White can try and push the pawn now but the game will end in a stalemate. If white plays b5, then king b7, b6, king b8 back, king a6, king a8 and black retains the opposition. Now b7 check, king b8, now white is forced to play king b6 and it's a stalemate. If black had played the move king c7 initially, then white could have won with the move king c5. White has the opposition now. Now king b7, king b5. Now if king c7 again, then king a6 wins the game because white king has gained access to the key square a6. On the other hand, if black goes king b8, then white goes king b6. White has gained access to the b6 square and wins the game. Now let us look at another famous position. It's white to move here. This position is quite interesting. What should white play here? Can white go for the move king d2? King d2 would gain the virtual opposition, right? Would that be enough to win the game? As a matter of fact, it won't be enough. White king has to reach any of the key squares b5, c5 or d5. Now he cannot reach these key squares if he starts with the move king d2. Now for example, if white plays king d2, then king e7, king e3, 
White has gained the distant opposition. Now King d7, King d3, King c7. Now White cannot go King c4 or King d4. If King c4 is played, then Black will gain the opposition with the move King c6. Now if King d4 is played, then Black will gain opposition with the move King d6. So King d2 cannot win the game for White. White has to start with the move King c2. Now White King is eyeing the key square b5. Now King e7, King b3, King d6 and King b4. White has gained the diagonal opposition now. Now if King c6 is played, then King c4 and White has gained the near opposition. Now if Black goes back with the move King c6, then White can go King b5. White King has reached the key square b5 and can win the game easily. So we have learned from this example that it is not always enough for the superior side to gain the opposition. There are other conditions that you have to meet. There are three specific conditions. Now let us take a look at another position which will help us better understand these three conditions. Condition number one, king has to be in front of the pawn. Condition number two, opposition has to be attained. Condition number three, king has to be on the sixth rank. Now this particular position has attained all the three conditions. But all these conditions are not necessary. If any of these two conditions are attained, the superior side can win the game. If these two conditions are not met, then the game will end in a draw. Let us use the idea of key squares once again. Take a look at this position. The white king is at e1, black king is at c7 and the white pawn is at g4. It's white to move here. f6, g6 and f6 are the key squares here. Can you find the winning move for white? Moves like king d2, king e2 and g5 cannot be played. All of these moves will result in a draw. For example, let us check out the move king e2. Now black plays king d6. Now the black king is ready to capture the opposition at the right moment. For example, if white king goes king d3, then king d5 gains the opposition and the game will end in a draw. You should also check out the moves king d2 and g5. Variations that begin with king d2 and g5 also will end in a draw. Now what's the winning idea? King f2 is the winning move. White king is targeting the key squares f6, g6 and h6. Black can play any move. It's not going to matter. Let us try out the move king d6. Now king g3, king e5. Black king is trying to get closer. Now king h4, king f6, king h5, king g7 and king g5. White king has gained the opposition now. Black king will have to give away the control of key squares now. For example, if king h7 is played, then king f6 can be played and white has gained access to the key square f6. White can win the game easily now. Guys, I've got exciting news for you. I'm going to conduct a puzzle rush contest for my subscribers. I'm going to give away 3 one month diamond club memberships of chess.com for my subscribers. You've got 7 days to participate in this contest. You must obtain your best puzzle rush score during these 7 days. Comment your highest score in puzzle rush below this video. The first 3 winners are going to get 1 month diamond club membership for free. You've got to subscribe to the channel to participate in this contest. You also need to send the screenshot of your highest puzzle rush score and the chess.com username to my email address. I've given the email address in the description. 
Diamond Club membership with Chess.com gives you unlimited access to all the cool features of Chess.com. Unlimited tactics, unlimited puzzle rush, unlimited lessons and unlimited videos. Subscribe to the channel and participate in this contest. Read the description below for more details of the contest.